I was 16 years old. Um, I had two strangers uh, come wake me up from my bed in the middle of the night. They put me into a car. We flew to Utah. Um, and, you know, they were next to me the whole entire time on either side of me. Once we arrived in Utah, we got into like a, it was like a truck and I was in the back seat. Um, they put, you know, a blindfold over my eyes and they had zip ties as well. I was put um, in a van taken to, um, I guess like the kind of home base building, if you will. And then I was put into other clothes, blindfolded and dropped in the middle of the wilderness with a group of girls. So actually my dad was like in the room with me. Okay, now I'm gonna cry. He was in the room with me and he like lured me into this um, office building, into this like room somehow. And then these people came in and I was just really confused. I don't even know what happened. And then all of a sudden like I'm on a plane. It was absolutely nothing like a boarding school it was it was literally a child prison and and I'm I don't say that lightly um it was it was truly a prison for children living at home with my parents um you know I I was getting into trouble. I was a teenager. I was experimenting with alcohol and marijuana and cigarettes, which is really pretty typical teen behavior. It's a grumpy 15 year old girl or whatever. And I was kind of depressed and I didn't really have like a friend group that I fit in with. So I just kind of like stayed in with myself and I was kind of shy. And my parents like always took that as I was being rude to them. And so it got to the point where they just like sent me away. I was like a super shy person before I left. Like I had my friend group. I was like a little bit rebellious here and there, but like I didn't really speak out until after everything happened. I started at Chrysalis in June of 2018. Um, I had spent four months at McLean Hospital in Boston. Um, where I worked intensively um, on my depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. Um, the official recommendation was to attend a therapeutic boarding school following that um, four months of treatment. My parents looked all around the country at a bunch of different schools. They visited four or five and found it seemed like Chrysalis was the best option. They looked at one in New York where a girl had run away and ended up in New York for uh, five months without them finding her. And then a couple in like North Carolina that they didn't love as much. And then they also looked at Montana Academy, which is near Chrysalis. The difference is it's co-ed, a longer stay. And they also had a recent incident where a kid there killed himself. So they went with Chrysalis. The basic idea is that um, people who are so-called troubled teens, uh, their fundamental problem is that they're selfish, horrible people. And that in order to get them to understand this, you need to be really tough on them. And the idea is that you can only break through their selfishness by breaking their personality and by attacking them and humiliating them and doing all kinds of things that we would see as abuse in any other setting, but that in this one we see as therapy. You know, my parents and I, my dad would take me out for breakfast. You know, we discuss these things and he alluded to going to a program, um, like a boarding school. He mentioned that, but uh, in terms of did I know that this was all gonna, you know, um, come to fruition? No, absolutely not. I didn't know I was gonna get woken up in the middle of the night. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't know. I, I wasn't using any hard drugs, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to end up dead or in jail like the educational consultants in my program um, told my parents. That, that was the outcome that they, that they told them. And so 
my parents, you know, they freaked out and they jumped on the bandwagon and were like, okay, my daughter needs this, you know, this is going to help her. This is therapeutic. Like, look at this beautiful campus. I've talked to a lot of girls um, that have been like, yeah, I just, one day I'm just sad. And then the next day my parents just send me away. And it's like, where is the communication? No one ever asked me like, are you okay? Like that type of damage like really fucks somebody up. The troubled teen industry is a billion dollar a year industry focused on behavior modifications of troubled teens. Teens are sent to programs by their parents, sometimes willingly, other times not, and spend months, sometimes years, trying to break the patterns they were sent there for. Programs within the troubled teen industry include wilderness therapy camps, therapeutic boarding schools, and residential treatment centers, all aimed at breaking the patterns of negative behavior of teens and forming new habits, often with a tough love approach. Some experts within the field will say that the troubled teen industry first began in 1958 with the Synanon program based out of California. The program used a model based around tough love and was solely peer run. The program used approaches such as attack therapy in which everyone in the program would circle up to yell at one another or one person in particular as a form of therapy or other methods such as public humiliation and brainwashing. While Synanon eventually began identifying as a cult, other programs based their models around what Synanon originally had in the works. One of the most notorious examples of this was Straight Incorporated, a 1976 program that was endorsed by the Reagans during the height of the war on drugs. They used the same tough love approaches, but eventually was exposed for a number of different abuse allegations and ultimately forced to close in 1993. Fast forward to 2021, the programs within the troubled teen industry have seen vast changes and a far more modern approach to behavioral modification, but this all comes at the cost of a pretty penny. Uh, 44000 I think, dollars for the wilderness program. Insurance did not cover anything for my boarding school. I think, I, I did the calculations and it's somewhere between 98000 and 108000 Despite all the changes being made to these programs, there is still no federal regulation for the troubled teen industry. This means that these programs are not required to be licensed. And even if they are, the license will vary from state to state and inspectors normally only come every one to three years. Physical, mental, and sexual abuse allegations still sometimes occur within these programs, which has brought awareness to the controversy surrounding the troubled teen industry as a whole. As some parents notice their children falling into a negative pattern, they might begin to seek out help. This could come in the form of numerous therapists, family therapists, or educational consultants. Educational consultants, particularly in my particular area of expertise, which really is therapeutic placement consulting, what we do is that we help families find appropriate placements for their children. And that could be short-term placements, longer-term placements, and our work involves generally traveling around the country and visiting programs and developing relationships with programs. And becoming educated about what they offer, staying up on what they offer. Wilderness therapy camps are camps that separate the children from their home environments and place them in the wilderness. These are often the first programs that teens enter before being sent to a therapeutic boarding school or residential treatment center. From there, the teens will hike every day with guides, set up camps, learn different wilderness skills, and often meet with therapists on a weekly basis. So everybody has patterns um of behavior in their life some of them are good some of them are bad um, most people who end up in wilderness therapy have some kind of bad pattern that's negatively impacting their life the idea with true north is they want guides to be working to push these kids patterns basically like try to get them to confront their these issues i came in with very minimal training in order to continue to operate with all their COVID protocols, they basically cut out a lot of the guide training 
typically guides get like to spend a week in the woods learning about all the like hard skills, like all the wilderness skills that are a part of the curriculum for the students, as well as the soft skills, like how to identify different patterns or behaviors and how to kind of push those patterns and give them different like coping mechanisms for them and such. But my training was an hour Zoom call, <laughs> kind of going over what a day looks like. And then I actually was a lead guide my third shift. We were really struggling. As I came in, a lot of the more experienced guides were kind of transferring out because I came in with a lot of wilderness skills and I had the ability to keep kids safely in the woods. They're like, here you go. And I was like, I don't know how to push patterns or what I'm supposed to be doing with such and such, or I don't know how to build traps or bow drill and I'm teaching them to do it, but okay. <laughs> there were two daily check-ins. It honestly sometimes felt like you're on your own little island, like they're aside from those two Collins and from like food drops or getting transported to a different section of woods. It was like barely like you're on your own. My fourth week was, it felt really isolating. It felt like I had to reach out a few times, not at those specific times to ask for help. And I didn't feel like I was being heard. Like I felt super isolated. I was like, there's no water here. We need water. And they had tried to bring in water the day before and the bluey with like five gallons of water had a hole in it. So by the time they got to us, there was an algae maybe left in it. And so I went like, I think almost 24 hours without water, having told them there's no water. My wilderness was, everybody says it's like the hardest wilderness because it's where they send like the drug addict, like teens. So it's really like they're detoxing and most of the people there were detoxing. So I was at the wilderness and immediately I couldn't talk to people for three weeks. It was almost a full month. I didn't talk to a single person because they, they had like a no talking rule. I lost my period when I got to this wilderness camp and I didn't get it for a year and a half, two years later. That's how much stress and pressure I was under. One of the problems, one of many problems with this industry that I saw is that there's a lot of people coming in and out guide-wise. You need a college degree, but it doesn't have to be in anything in particular, right? So you don't need to have anything. You don't have to have any experience in the wilderness like they'd like that, but you, it's not required. You don't need to have any kind of education background or therapy background or anything. So there's plenty of people coming in who really should not be working in the field of wilderness therapy. There's not enough training, so they're throwing people in. People are unprepared. They're in over their heads. They realize they don't like it, and so they leave. And so they need more guides. And it's challenging because everybody that I interacted with, like from the hiring people, like all the way up and down, is like super passionate about it. Like they're in it for the right reasons. It's almost too bad because I feel like there's a lot of things that draw me to that industry, but there's so many, it's just so like morally complicated that I don't know if I can ever work at it again. Like there were, there are a few kids that when I initially started working with them, I was like, oh, okay. Like this kid's normal as fuck. They just smoked a lot of weed and fought with their parents a bunch. But the more I worked with them, the more I was like, all right, maybe there's other ways for them to have this recovery, but they definitely like have some shit that they need to work on. They also have, young adult program which is ages 18 through 23 and that one's interesting because they are legal adults and they can technically sign themselves out of the program but the job of the guide if they like really want to is just to like make it really really hard for them to do that if there's a kid freaking out and they're like we're like i'm out of here i'm done like i'm signing myself out as a guide you're supposed to basically sit be like all right true north headquarters is in waitsfield 20 miles that way so as a whole, I it was a really awesome like learning experience for me. There was so much that I've taken away from it. And I did also see some really great things. Like I worked with the same group for three three weeks in a row. And so getting to see like how they progressed through it was really awesome. But overall my experience there was not great. And I think like my biggest complaint is the lack of training and sustaining of their guides. I always felt like I kind of got the short end of the stick of a lot of experiences. Like I got put in with some really rough groups repeatedly and then other guides would come out and they're working with the young adults group and they're like, oh, it was so much fun. We just like sat around the campfire all day. And I was like, 
Um, I had two kids on safety watch trying to kill themselves and a kid ran away. Once a parent decides what program they'd like to send their child to, they may feel they have no choice but to use youth transport services or goons as they're called within the industry. These are services that are paid by the parents to bring their child from their home to their program, which can sometimes be a plane ride away. These transporters are often used as a means of intervention. However, the transportation of the teen can sometimes bring more attention to their situation if not handled properly by the transporters. Goons will sometimes come in the middle of the night to take the child away and can use restraints such as zip ties, blindfolds, or handcuffs to take their child to their destination. Therapeutic boarding schools and residential treatment centers are programs within the troubled teen industry. Teens will typically live within these program bases from nine months to one year. Teens attending these programs live with roommates at the programs and receive schooling as well as group and individual therapy. However, schooling is often inadequate. What was a normal day like at Chrysalis? So basically we would wake up in the morning we would immediately go to work out. Half the girls would be sleeping on the floor, the other half are like arguing with staff. And then afterwards we'd go back to the houses and eat breakfast, which was always super shitty, super fattening. All the food was so bad. If we didn't get all of our chores checked off, we weren't allowed to eat breakfast. I remember the first day they went through the orientation handbook, which is like this, um, probably like 30 pages of all the different rules and, the different phase systems, which is how you move up in the program. And I immediately started trying to check off the different boxes and do the different assignments. You were allowed to write letters to your parents twice a week, but your therapist read them. It was really clear to me that if you asked your parents to make you leave or to take you home, that you wouldn't get off the phase, which was acceptance. Every time I talked to my parents on the phone, I started sobbing and you took the phone calls in the staff office so that they could overhear like what you were talking about. And I think you got five or 10 minutes to talk to them. They take away all of your rights and they make them privileges. And it's like, it's not a privilege for me to be able to ask for like a hug from my friend. I just remember being so depressed. Like I just remember waking up like every day and being like, I don't wanna wake up tomorrow. Like it fucking sucked. The teens will live with staff members, most of whom don't require any background in mental health or education before being hired. It's a minimum wage basic entry job in Eureka, Montana. And they say we prefer experience and education, but it's not required. So a lot of these people that would come and start working would start getting trained there with zero experience, zero education, no experience in the mental health field. The therapist didn't have to be psychologists. There wasn't a single psychologist on staff. No one had their doctorate. There were some people that had their master's or maybe they had experience working in a wilderness. So some of them had a college degree. Some of them were social workers. There was a psychiatrist who came every three months, and he met with all 30 girls on the same day for probably 10 or 15 minutes. My room was right next to the isolation room, and so I would hear girls screaming, crying, banging their heads against the walls constantly. And they put girls in there for, for weeks, for months. A lot of the girls were on high doses of Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic, and it subdues you and makes you tired. Seroquel is also used for sleeping. It's a sleep medication in lower doses. I have this memory of sitting, waiting to go into the cafeteria, and before we could eat our like dinner, we had a nurse come around and she basically gave us sharp shots of uh, Gardasil. Gardasil is like a HPV shot, we had something called problem solving group and it was really attack therapy and attack therapy again is something that's taken from the Synanon cult and it's essentially where we all sit in a circle and we have all staff members there and they 
essentially pick on a person and they berate you for like an hour or two hours and they just go to town on you about your biggest insecurities. Like you are the reason why your parents almost got divorced. You know, your dad's autoimmune dis diseases. That's because of all the stress that you created in his life. Your dad's sick because of you. I mean, these are the things that they told me. Teens, adolescents, it, these are our formative years. This is where a lot of our development happens. To be put into a place like this, like an institution where you have all your rights stripped from you, really messes with your psyche and does a lot of damage to your brain. The thing you have to consider is that when a child is isolated in a facility where they cannot contact the outside world, they have absolutely no privacy, and they're surrounded by people who think that hurting them helps. It's an incredibly disorienting experience. Coming home, I felt like I had no self-esteem after I got back. I blamed myself for having been sexually assaulted, which I had not done until going there. The thing to me that like breaks my heart is like you put these kids who like smoked a little pot and they're in there with kids who really have had serious drug experience and you tell them that like they all have this chronic disease for the rest of their life and they're always going to have to worry about relapse. Well, not surprisingly, some of the kids who only did the, you know, softer drugs are going to see like, wait a minute, I didn't even get to try the cool stuff and like I have this for life. Like, hey, can you tell me where to get that? It's a terrible way of dealing with kids with drug problems and especially telling them they're horrible over and over and over means that when they get out, they kind of feel bad about themselves. And what works really well for that? Drugs. So I was on a team of 20 people. Two of them have died by suicide. We have an ongoing list of people who have died by suicide or have died overdosing on drugs. People are killing themselves because they cannot cope with the the complex PTSD and the depression and anxiety and some kids did come in with some anxiety depression some other mental health disorders but let me tell you these places really cause a lot of trauma and um, I definitely left with a lot more issues than I came in with complex PTSD is essentially when you're put into a situation in which you are completely helpless. You feel like your life is being threatened on the daily, essentially. Like it keeps occurring over and over and over again. What happens when, when you're in this place, you're in survival mode, essentially 24 seven, because you are watched over like a hawk. All of us are, right? And what you do, and what I did is I had to really shut down and just focus on surviving. How does that play out in, in, in our daily life? It means that a lot of the time we're still in that fight or fight or freeze mode. And so much of, of PTSD is somatic, meaning that it's a physical response. So I'll be at the grocery store or something for an example, and I'll feel completely safe in my head. Like, okay, you know, I'm just at the grocery store, but my body will be in straight up panic mode. So like my heart will start beating really fast where I feel like I can't control, control it. Like my throat will feel like it's closing. So how exactly is all of this legal? In order to understand this, we must first take a look at child abuse laws in the United States. There are two main child abuse prevention acts that protect children in the U.S. The first law is the Federal Law of Child Abuse and Prevention and Treatment Act, or CAPTA. This is a federal law that provides grants to states to support the prevention, assessment, investigation, prosecution, and treatment of child abuse and neglect. Next, there's the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, or CRIPA. This is a federal law that protects the rights of people in state or local correctional facilities, nursing homes, and mental health facilities. However, this act does not apply to privately owned agencies and institutions, which include most programs within the troubled teen industry. Next, programs within the troubled teen industry will sometimes use power of attorney contracts. These are contracts between the parents and the program 
that allows parents to hand over the parental rights of their child to the program while the child is still in their care, which grants a lot more power to the programs over the child. It is extremely difficult for a teenager to sue a youth transport service in the U.S. due to the differences between kidnapping and voluntary consent. Kidnapping, which is illegal in the U.S., must be against the will of the victim. In most cases of youth transport services, these services are used as an intervention method, where the transporters will intervene with a child, sometimes for hours on end, until eventually they agree to go. Regardless of the fact that they may feel they don't have a choice, they have to give their voluntary consent. For other programs within the troubled teen industry, there have been investigations done into the alleged abuses within these programs, the most notable being the Government Accountability Office in 2007. This report reviewed wilderness therapy programs and other teen facilities which found thousands of allegations of abuse at these programs from 1990 through 2007, and even reports of death. The report concluded that the hiring of untrained staff, a lack of adequate nourishment, reckless or negligent practices, and a lack of adequate equipment all played a significant role in the deaths that the GAO examined. Since then, there have been some changes made to the industry, such as more and more members being added to the National Association of Therapeutic Schools and Programs. This is a nonprofit membership association for programs within the troubled teen industry. It shaped the industry by instating rules for membership, like requiring all members to be licensed by their state and be nationally accredited by 2023. However, the problem lies in the fact that it is a voluntary program, meaning a membership is not required by therapeutic boarding schools, wilderness therapy programs, or residential treatment centers. Finally, one of the major problems within the troubled teen industry comes with lawsuits against these programs. When programs are faced with a lawsuit, they will sometimes shut down their school and reopen under a different name in order to not lose business. However, oftentimes these new programs will still be run by the same exact management and staff and will continue the same practices. During her first 24 hours, she was stripped naked and told to squat and cough. She had to shower with de-lousing shampoo. No evidence of lice. The sh uh, shampoo, the soap is really caustic and really burns your skin. When she had to use the restroom, take a shower, she had to do it with the door open so staff could watch her. They had three categories of food. They had they would double your portion if you had an eating disorder, and if you didn't eat at all, you'd be punished. They gave you a half portion if they thought you needed to lose weight. And my daughter was in that group, according to them, even though she was not overweight. So she only got half a portion of meals. She had to sleep in the hallway on a mattress, and she was not allowed to talk to anyone. In the first couple of days, she was given a forced pap smear which I would never have consented to. A number of the abusive practices were in the parent handbook, but we didn't, we didn't know how to interpret them. So for example, the level system. So when they explained it to us, it sounded like you're rewarded for doing what your responsibilities are. And that made perfect sense. But in actuality, it's used as a way to control the kids and they, have, they are punished for the smallest of offenses, for offenses that they are not even aware of were offenses. 25 pages of things kids were punished for. They, they restrict communications between children and their parents so that parents really don't know what's going on. And they also really prime us not to believe anything our children tell us. And they start, they just sort of pound that concept into our head. And then she was introduced to the therapy. And that was one of the hardest parts for her. She didn't realize that her therapist was reading all of the mail that she wrote to us because they would write letters, seal them, the staff would put a stamp in mail, they thought. But in reality, 
the staff would open the letters and read them and censor them. So if it had a lot of bad stuff, parents just never got the letter. But if there was not that much that they had objection to, they would black it out with an magic marker and just put a note in the margin. We didn't think that this part, that this part of the letter was really productive to your relationship. And she didn't know that the therapist had opened it and sent us a copy. She thought that we had gotten a letter and were so mad about it that we just faxed it to the therapist right away. We were told, Colleen is too angry to talk to you right now. You know, we're not going to have a phone call this week. And I, I asked her about it not long ago. And she said, oh my God, I desperately wanted to talk to you. Starting with the education consultant and then the admission staff, and then the parent handbook, and a parent weekend seminar, and the therapist. We heard from every side that your child is going to try to get out of this place, and she's going to lie to you, and she's going to manipulate you. And they were specific about the things that she would tell us. And in retrospect, that was another huge red flag. I just regretted so much that we had sent her there, and I wanted to make it right. A lot of the parents sort of have these expectations that, you know, a few sessions of counseling will fix this or that the problem is fundamentally the kid. It has nothing to do with the parenting. And while it is certainly the case that parents do not cause people to become addicted or mentally ill, there certainly are abusive parents out there that can exacerbate any pre-existing tendencies in those directions. I felt very, very guilty for a very long time. I was just devastated. And finally, Colleen said to me, Mom, if I can forgive you, you should be able to forgive yourself. And that was a turning point for me. We thought that this was our only, you know, this was our only option. And most parents say that. So many of us were told, you're going to lose your child if you don't send her here. You're gonna lose your child to an overdose or suicide if you don't send your child here. Before being referred to Island View, Colleen had seen many, many therapists and psychiatrists. She had been on many different types of medication. None of them had really helped her. By the time parents get to the stage where they consult with an education consultant, they're really desperate and they just want to find the right program for their children. And in our case, um, Colleen's father was an attorney. Her stepmother was a psychologist. And I used to teach graduate level marketing and advertising classes. So you would think that we would see through any deceptive advertising and we'd be able to see warning signs if there was anything in the contract that was problematic. But all three of us looked at this program and the parent manual and we all thought it looked fine. When a program tells you, look, you send the kid, we'll fix them. That is a very appealing message, not because they're horrible, bad, selfish parents, but because they have been constantly blamed and because it seems like everything else failed and because they don't know what to expect. They don't know that the vast majority of kids who are acting out just outgrow it. Basically, the main thing to do if your kid has any kind of addictive behavior or mental illness or, or something that is very off, you want a complete psychiatric evaluation from somebody who is legitimate, who is not associated with any facilities, ideally the highest credentialed person you can get in what you think is the problem. There's evidence-based approaches to treating depression and you can seek them just like you would if your kid had cancer. Similarly, if they have an anxiety disorder or if they have Asperger's or if they have whatever it may be, you want the care that goes with whatever the diagnosis is. I think the most important thing to discuss is that the therapies or the treatments that need to be used are evidence-based treatment. You need to keep your child close because you want to continue that relationship, that interpersonal connection, that relationship is crucial. You don't want your child to feel abandoned. You don't want them to deal with attachment issues. You know, I work with adolescents. I know that kids deal with suicidal ideation, you know, mental health disorders. 
And there's options that are more community-based. So there's outpatient therapies, there's outpatient treatment, there's inpatient psychiatric hospitals. Make sure that the therapist is relatable to them. So as an adolescent, I had a 65, 70 year old woman that I did not relate to. And just this very punitive experience where I just felt judged and I did not feel like I could open up because I knew whatever I would say, she would tell my parents. So there is absolutely no truth um, coming out of those sessions. It's the type of world we live in. It's like a quick fix. Let's take the kid off your hands and let's uh, modify them and they'll come back. They'll be better off. And in reality, that's not the case. Kids are often much worse. But yeah, like I think that's just the way of the world these days, especially in the US. We want quick fixes. We want things before we even know we want them. We get what we need so quickly that we just feel like there's solutions to these problems. In reality, like a lot of the time kids don't need to be go to any sort of program. After I found out a lot of what I know now about the abuses in the residential treatment center, I started looking for one that would be not bad. And so I thought, well, there has to be good programs out there that are really good. So I looked for six months and I couldn't find any because they all follow the same playbook. So I started a Facebook group called RTC Alternatives for Desperate Parents of Troubled Teens. So, so I started this other group just to provide a resource to parents who were thinking about it. There are a few things that I wish I had known before I sent Colleen away. One of them is that teenagers go through a perfectly normal developmental phase where they do things that drive their parents crazy but they are all developmentally appropriate and they're necessary for to grow into a healthy adult. So they will challenge you, they will take risks, they will experiment, there's all sorts of things. If your child is old enough to be sent away, your child is old enough to have a say in their treatment. And that's where we all went wrong. When I learned more and more about this industry, I wanted to do something about it. And the first thing I did was the Facebook group so that parents would have options. And the second thing I did was to start a parents group because finding out that you are responsible for your child being abused so badly that they are gonna have PTSD for the rest of their lives and you made that choice and you sent them there, that's devastating. It's really, really hard to deal with and it's very painful. What you do with those feelings, you can't talk to your child about it. You can't go to your child for comfort about the feelings about a decision that you made. They didn't have a choice. You did. With the help of groups like Breaking Code Silence and advocates like Paris Hilton, strides have been made to prevent abuse within these programs. The most important step to take surrounding the troubled teen industry is advocating for regulation. This would mean evidence-based treatment in all programs, proper training and experience for staff, and licensing for all programs. But there is still more that needs to be done.